or anything that's resisting your will. We speak peace over this whole meeting and our time together and just ask you to release your life to all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If I can work hard on my no, you've been over We are now so recording. You... Okay. And we may or may not be streaming on Facebook, but that's okay. We will be going right. on Facebook, but I'll upload the recording to Facebook since um I'll take it from here. All right. So this is a really interesting discussion in that I'm not even sure if I agree with me in what I'm thinking. So I really appreciate the chance to work with the group mind to process this. So one of the questions that I've been asking as part of this great reset is what does God actually want? And to come up with a really simple way of understanding it so we can actually check whether we are doing it. And so, you know, there's many things that God says, um, but I kind of try to make it as simple as possible so I can actually be clear on whether or not I'm doing it. So what does God want of us? Like, what is the change he wants us to make externally? What does he want for us? What is the gift he wants to give us? And what does he want from us in our relationship? Those seem like three fairly simple, straightforward questions to ask in a relationship. Everyone with me so far? Yes. Okay. So the perspective I have is the best way to describe what God wants is this idea of wholeness. So what God wants is a whole world of whole people loving all of the one God. Uh, you know, that's the Great Commission. That's the Adamic Covenant. Uh, that is the Great Commandments. Uh, the greatest commandments, they all seem to come back to this. I mean, and also, you know, this is deliberately a pun on the word holiness, mm -hmm. uh, which is the idea that God wants us to be whole. And this is something that came to me when I was doing this class on spiritual entrepreneurship, is that we've often defined Christianity and holiness as kind of a backward-looking uh, traditional thing. And you know, the idea of rephrasing this as a forward-looking um, act of flourishing, right? Holiness is not setting ourselves apart to follow some obscure ritual to be faithful to the past, although that's been critically and vitally important for the survival of Christianity and Judaism before that. But looking forward, it's trying to move into this idea of wholeness. So, um, I guess Stephen, uh, my educator friend, is hopefully going to be able to jump on shortly. So that sounds pretty good there. But then the question is, okay, how do we do something with this? And the thing that really struck me is that our starting point is not that. Our starting point is our faction of fractured people loving a fraction of God. And that's the predicament we find ourselves in at least I find myself in, is that, you know, I've got people that are with me on this journey, but we're not the whole world. We're just a faction of it. And I am not a whole person. I am broken. I'm messed up. I'm confused. And this was something, my wife had a vision of this earlier this week, which was very powerful. I only see a fraction of God. and incomplete? <laughs> hey, right. Stephen, thanks for jumping on with us. <laughs> this is just kind of my, this is a just for those of you jumping in late as well this is a discussion group that i started a few weeks ago with ted um and the subtitle is 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 exploring the great reset as all of our existing institutions are either closed down or operating in very different I thought ways the great reset was the main title and the subtitle was the title of each week yeah sorry yeah so uh, it, it's a little more confusing that the great reset is the title. Um, and what I've been trying to do is, a, is have a general subtitle to describe the whole arc, which is this idea of growing a resilient faith. The idea is, and this kind of gets back to the same theme here, if I can tie this all together, is that our existing institutions were based on certain assumptions about reality and about who we are and how we relate to God. And there's enormous richness and power and wisdom in all of those things. But 
most of those institutions are struggling to figure out how to respond to the current situation because they were mostly built around centralization. We come to a central place. We have a central authority. And in particular, there was often an implicit assumption that we have the whole answer and we just need to get other people to adopt our answer and they'll be good. And there was often an understanding that that was not the whole truth, but that was the truth we tended to focus on. And as part of dealing with this world we're living in now, where our centralized institutions are diminished in their capacity to serve us, I've been on this quest to figure out how do we come up with a more resilient expression of Christianity, uh, adopting a more decentralized posture. And so that's kind of the, the, the theme that I'm exploring through this idea of the Great Reset. And this week, the, the title of this episode or this session is wrestling with this idea of wholeness in terms of what God wants from us. And in particular, the painful, but I think undeniable fact that I and we are not whole. We can't just say, be like us, because we are not the answer. Christ is the answer. God is the answer. Uh, his wholeness is the thing we are all striving toward. But the implication of that is that what we need to be doing <clears throat> is that if we want people to ad um, we're not telling people to throw away their understanding. We're asking them to incorporate our understanding. We have had this experience of Christ. We've had this experience of wholeness and communion with God. And we want people to add this to who they currently are so they become richer. And the best way to do that is by showing them how we add and incorporate their insight. And the logic of this seems to make sense to me intellectually, but emotionally, it's really a struggle because this is in deep tension with how I have previously understood evangelism and discipleship. So that's where I'm at. That's pretty much all I had to say. Ted, you had a question or a comment. Old school, raise your hand. I'm sure there's a way to raise your hand in Zoom, but this is old school. No, I'm um, <laughs> fired up. I love it all. Um, a very practical application or um, a practical example of what you're talking about. Um, my friend, Julie Young, uh, you guys know Julie, formerly JD, now Young. She's uh, just called me up. She was very, very excited. Um, Palo Alto Vineyard, um, uh, they, they're, they're responding well to the coronavirus. Um, and one of the beautiful things this is brought out, they're doing, I think it's called Contagious Hope is what they've titled this. They're raising food for the needy. Mm. Um, and the way they're doing is uh, basically everyone's going to their neighbors and rather than tell, asking them what their needs are, they're engaging with their neighbors on, uh, uh, hey, do you want to give groceries? This is what we need. Boom. And then they're, they, of course, they've targeted uh, in Palo Alto a couple places where they know the at-risk people are and they're helping them. But approaching their neighbors that way, one, they're getting a tremendous, it's going viral, they're getting a tremendous response. But two, that's the way, two, that's the way in. So now you're engaging with your, net, your neighbors, you're building the network, now you know where the needs are. So you say, oh, by the way, how can we what do you need? How can we minister to you? So it, 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 and approaching that way is so much more affirming than, hey, uh, you know, you hungry? What, what, you know, approaching it in a way that's condescending. And then um, uh, there's a third benefit that escapes my mind. But when it comes back to me, I'll share it. <laughs> but those two are awesome. <laughs> What's the third benefit? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, thank you, Ted. And what I often do, if, if I have ideas, I write them in the chat. That way, if I forget them, we can look back and find them. And I don't have to I didn't even have enough time. I forgot it too quick to even write in the chat. I, I was thinking on okay. the phone. All right. 
Uh, so Stephen, uh, one of the reasons I dragged you into this uh, is because I know you studied uh, education and learning extensively. And you're very passionate about not being the sage on the stage, giving everyone the answers, but about really inviting people into a place of discovery. And I'm curious if you thought about and sharing where they discover and share their own answers. You still there? Your video dropped off. Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah, I was wondering, have me? you ever thought about that? Yes, we can hear you. I'm wondering, have you ever thought about how that applies to evangelism and how the church engages with the world? <laughs> After listening to, to Ted, the plot, to, but <laughs> no, dude, come on now. I'm a professor. This is what happens all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> um, I I am still capturing what Ted just said about Vineyard Palo Alto stepping out and saying, "Look, just like when the Christians were in Rome." and people are dying all over the place, they didn't leave, they stayed, they served, they cared for even at the cost of their own lives. If this is not the same context, I don't know what else could possibly be. So, so that's still resonating in my head. Now, the, the question that, that you're asking about, about my, my viewpoint on, on what I call the discovery learning process, it is, it is hard but powerful. The hard part is, you're leading someone into a way of thinking about something. So if that's evangelism, as you had suggested as a topic, you try to inspire that person in thinking, how could I be an evangelist when I don't have the gift of evangelism? And that isn't what evangelism is all about. But you have to then patiently wait. You have to wait for that person to give something back, to give a little inclination that they're listening, that they're learning, that they're taking a step forward. Every small step, you celebrate it, and you applaud, and you find a way to encourage them to take the next small step. It is not a fast process, but it is the learning process of the individual, and that is much more meaningful than if they just listened to me and did what I said. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. So this is one of the interesting tension points that I would love to explore with all of you, is that most of the models I am familiar with come from a position where we're trying to create a change or invite people into things. Yeah. It comes from a position of status where you come in as a facilitator or as a professor or as a preacher or as a missionary. And therefore, there is a risk of compliance as you're addressing with. The one of the flips I am trying to figure out and trying to model and explain and understand myself is that often our picture of evangelism or engaging with the world, I think Todd is touching on this too, is from a position like that, where you know, we assume that we have the status and that we're in danger of compliance, whereas in fact, I am increasingly in context where the opposite is true, whereas I'm actually coming in almost with a negative status and, uh, well, and one of the problems is I'm status blind, and therefore, I think I'm coming in with a neutral or positive status, but in fact, I may be coming in with a negative status, and I have to figure out how to create a context of inviting people into this learning discovery process there. So anyway, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm actually articulating any clear here in question, as much as trying to articulate my predicament and see if that resonates with any of you. And like oh, always, Ted. I have something to say. No, I mean, we were talking with some friends and, and uh, oh, hey, it was a perfect example, a friend of mine <laughs> who by necessity, I've had to learn, uh, you know, what is that? Where you let them come up with the idea themselves because I tell them something and they disagree with me. But it, so I learned how to space it out just and let them say the whole thing themselves. <laughs> uh, but he, it was so cool. He was talking about Mark and about the conclusion of Mark being uh, these signs will follow those who believe. And recently I read that because pretty much it's always been presented to me in a very religious context, you know, like, you know, 
I mean, the most dramatic example of that, I'm gonna mute you, John. Okay, you can unmute yourself. Uh, the most dramatic example is the, the extreme Pentecostal groups that would carry snakes around and say, ooh, look it, you know, can't hurt us. You know, you're seeing that happen today though, where you're in the news, some, and I don't think that, I, I don't throw anyone under the bus. I don't really think it's fair, but some of the Pentecostal groups are being, like one pastor, uh, didn't shut down a meeting it wasn't illegal but it was just before the lockdown he kept his conference because he had obligations to a speaker there was all this momentum he's actually died of the coronavirus and a lot of people in his church got sick i mean to me that's just tragic and we shouldn't i mean lots of people made mistakes like that who's to say it's a mistake except looking backwards but i'm saying it's a similar thing but our conversation, the, the, the whole point is that I was been reading that through a different paradigm, exactly of what you're saying, Ernie, that Jesus was saying Christianity is meant to be demonstrated, not taught from a place of authority, uh, demanding compliance, but teaching from a place of best practices that is demonstrated. Like I recently had a radical paradigm shift because I was always afraid of that passage where Paul said, uh, follow me as I follow Jesus. I'm like, man, Paul has arrived. That's the ultimate status. Like I follow man, I'm the man, follow me. I'm like, wow, I better be holy if I'm gonna say that. Recently, I had a complete different paradigm and I saw Paul saying that from a place of tremendous humility where he was saying, rather than me be in the place of a person of status, I have no status, I'm the worst of sinners. But you can follow me because there's somebody with me who I'm following who's greater than me. Like I completely, I saw it completely a different way. Like, the, like what Paul was saying, the only thing of value I have to offer is not my status, not my accomplishments, those are all worthless. But what I have to offer is I'm following someone and that they had, and I reread the whole book. I've been re, re still, I'm in this process, rereading the whole book of Acts, that it's like, it's around this real presence who was really there, who made decisions that they did not see, that opened up the door, that not only did stuff when they prayed, but overrode their prayers. That was, he was the real actor. Not only was he a real actor there, he was the center stage. He was the secret sauce. He was LeBron James on your team. It's all built around him. <sighs> I love it when you put your hands up like that, Ernie. It really inspires me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just feeling shivers. Um, this oh, this is the thing I want to worship, right? God's wholeness and our brokenness. That's how we save the world. I have a homework okay, assignment. God is good and I am not. Homework assignment for all of you. Go to my Facebook page and look at the post I shared about my wife. She's raising her hand. Worship of the Lord. You take those things for granted unless you're dying and for several months you can't even raise your hand. And then you pray and God comes through and he anoints somebody. It's a miracle. And you can, whatever, you can write it away and say it was just a diagnosis. No, yes, it was. And I bless doctors. I bless them. Yeah, you know, we need to affirm them. This doctor was anointed. And regardless of the anointing, Jesus is the one who heals. He came in the night before. I mean, it's been a process. I don't want to make it more than what it was. I don't want to make it more dramatic than what it was, but it was so dramatic. She went to bed discouraged. Do I have permanent nerve damage, which is a real possibility? Am I never going to walk again? Not only can I not walk, it's weird. My balance is off. I'm a dancer. Like she was down. It's just, God, help me, help me. And he showed up. She, we felt, she felt his presence. I felt his presence too. She's more sensitive. There she is. She over her all night. And she woke up and for the first time in months. She was able to raise her hands. I tell you, it, looking at, it, it, it's, it, take up your bed and follow me. But the other thing about it, folks, is like I saw it. It was such a weird experience for me to see her out there, see her arms up. And like, like I mean, the, the, the emotions. I mean, this was like, 
I'm falling in love with her all over again. And then I'm processing my emotions that I've pushed down where, you know, I have not faced the reality because I had to for dysfunction. My wife was dying, like pernicious anemia. We didn't know what it's called, but she's dying. We, and, and God intervened and I, what, but it was so interesting to see. I didn't feel like God, like, I felt that Jesus was leading us out of the valley of the shadow of death. But what I have experienced and learned about his presence when I've been in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, like I know him is so real. Like, like, was that a better experience or the experience when I felt like total roadkill and he didn't heal her, but he gave me enough to make it through to the next day. And I felt his presence so tangibly. It's him. It's him. And the whole world, God wants to pour out his spirit upon the whole world. He wants the whole world to experience him. They don't need us. They don't need our words. They don't need us at our best. They don't need us looking good with, you know, tight jeans on. They need him, his presence, his presence. Now, yes, we need to be anointed. We need to be excellent in every area. We need to be authorities in the sense of do your due diligence. But I mean, Paul we need to do that all and then realize that's nothing. That's just a worship that, that I do to him. It was grace that he gave me to be able to do it. It still doesn't raise me up anymore from the worst of sinners. It's him. And he rose from the dead and he is alive. Man, Lord, just, just use us, use us to, to, to share that message, to open up the, the, the eyes of the law, to see you. Yeah, and I think that the, um, you know, the the beauty of your story, right, is that we can celebrate and praise God when we see the deliverance and, and thank God for that deliverance. But we also, and some of the most poignant times even on this broadcast that you shared, is when we praise God in the valley, when we don't know how it's going to turn out, right? Lazarus was raised from the dead. Uh, but not everyone was. But still, we have the promise at the end. And living in that tension, living in that shadow, living in that brokenness is so hard. But that is the thing, and I, I, I don't know if I told you this before, but, you know, it's great when I hear you praise God, but it's so much greater when I hear what you had to go through in order to praise God. The struggles, the fears, the doubts, and the anxiety that you wrestled through to get to that point of praising God. Because that's what I can identify with, right? Because if I just see the end result, I don't know what it costs you. And I don't know if you face the same pain and fears and anxieties and doubts and struggles than I did. But as I see that in you, as I see that in scripture, as we're seeing that in each other in this season of extraordinary vulnerability, that is, you know, that's Christ in the manger. That's Christ in the cross. That's vulnerability. That is what the world, I think, is hungry for, authenticity, right? The, the buzzword of this generation. It's, it, it's letting them say, you know, hey, we don't have, and the one thing I love about where we're getting, seem to be coming to is that this is not about having all the answers, because that to me is a fragile faith. Because once you meet a question you can't answer, it's game over. But I've heard this is, is that I just, there's this thing I have seen when I was at rock bottom in the valley of the shadow of death that was bigger than me, that brought me out of it. And that's the thing I want other people to see, is that God is that good uh, when I've got nothing. And I think that is a beautiful gift we get to give people out of our emptiness and our brokenness that is inaccessible when everything's going well and when we look like we have it all together. Anyway, I'm rambling a bit. John, you haven't said much at all. Can you uh, be yourself? I, I don't have much to say. Can you hear me now? Um, yes, sir. Okay, fine. I really don't have much to say. I've just been pondering what you said, Ernie, about, about what we have to offer. And I was listening very carefully, Ted, to what you said about Paul's posture of being acknowledging from humility that he was not the one to follow, but Jesus was the one to follow. And uh, both of those things resonate with me. Uh, but this is a day when I'm not drawing very many conclusions about what I'm hearing. 
I, I just feel like we continue to touch on things that are really cr crucial for us as a people to become as effective in this world as God intends us to be. And uh, I appreciate that this time for discussion, even though I don't <laughs> sometimes understand exactly what we've said or where we're going, but it feels like we're moving toward greater understanding. So that's my reflection. All right, thank you. Stephen, I knew you kind of literally jumped into the middle of this. Um, anything you'd like to say to, as we wrap things up or reflect on? Uh, yes, it's my voice coming through because I can never, I'm on, a, I'm on Zoom on a phone and I haven't used it this way before. So, um, Ted, you're talking about Philippians chapter three, which is a study that Ernie and I are in in the Bible app and it addressed everything you just said about Paul uh, reflecting on, well, if, it, if you should follow anyone, it would be me because, and then he goes through the list of all of his um, accolades and accomplishments. And then he says, but it's all lost for the sake of Christ. And he brings himself, he reminds us of the humility with which he adopted. And then he says to us, I wish, I wish for you all to be like me, to follow my example. And that example of leadership is a leadership by influence as opposed to by power mm -hmm. or by status. Because yes. Paul had the status, right, Ernie? He had it. Mm -hmm. He gave it up, just like Christ gave up, gave up his kingship over, over all of creation to become like us, to empathize with us, to be um, connected to us on a sympathetic and empathetic level. He gave all of that up so that his leadership could be by the influence of his actions. Mm -hmm. He also had the power of using his words as Paul uses his words. But you have to, we have been deceived by words so easily. Paul also addresses this in 2 Corinthians when he writes back to them and says, oh, you've been listening to these bad old secondhand um, preachers, but I'm really the authentic guy here. And you seem to have forgotten that because they tickle your ears with what you want to hear. Okay, that's, that's Steve's paraphrase of a lot of Second Corinthians, but the, the gist is very similar. Um, when we demonstrate our faith in our Lord by the actions that we take, mm. that's the kind of leadership influence that I feel that Jesus and the Lord are leading us into. It is as evident by the things we choose not to do as it is evident by what we choose to do. So we are marked, as brothers in Christ, we are marked um, by what we do and what we don't do because people are watching and following. So it's by the influence of what we do and not so much by what we say. Mm -hmm. Did I capture? So for coming in halfway through, but knowing Ernie well enough, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Stephen, uh, and I appreciate your jumping in and joining us. Um, I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed with just gratitude and joy, and I feel like I'm on holy ground. Um, I don't know why it feels silly in some ways. It's just four of us on a five of us on a Zoom call, um, rambling on about how good God is, but uh, but we're gathered together, Ernie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gathered together, and, and, and I feel like we are, we are laying ourselves on the altar of the internet, if you will, and feeling like, hey, this is who we are, and this is who God is to us. And I, and, I, and I love John's perspective, like, I'm not sure what's going on. I can't explain it, but this is good. This is mm -hmm. valuable. This is important. And him saying that just means so much to me, and him not needing to explain it or conceptualize it is also incredibly powerful for me because, you know, I, um, when I see Christ, there really are no words. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen to that. All right. I'm going to drag John in to close us out <laughs> in prayer.
May I pray before he closes this out too? I, want, I feel like praying. Oh, feel free. And if anybody else wants to pray. Lord, Lord, I just thank you for this, Father. Lord, I just, yes. just see these mm -hmm. words that inspired me, and I just ask, you want all of us. Mm -hmm. You want uh, the whole world. Yes. You want us uh, to demonstrate your glory. Lord, I pray that right now, Lord, um, Lord, that is we're, we're bringing the poor, the needy before you. Father, and as, as we're each on our own way, Lord, seeking to help and serve, I pray that the, 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 that the community, Lord, that we'll be able to reach out and meet their needs, Lord. I bless the efforts wherever they come from, Father. Lord, and I pray, I see a synergy, I see a creativity that is to solve problems, Lord, uh, like, like in rare periods of mm -hmm. history. Yes. Lord, I pray that both will be able to lay hold of that, but also uh, during the season, this unique season. Lord, I pray for all the followers of Jesus that they'll shift from fear to opportunity Amen. and love, and and yes. and just trusting you and the the uh, the openness that's out there, and they'll say yes to the needs, Lord, mm -hmm. and and respond. But I also yes. pray that we'll lay hold of this, Lord. I believe, like even what Ernie is sharing, Lord, there's there's best some of the best thought leaders in the world are talking about what can happen when we're united when we're not fighting when we're not worried when we're all aligned and we touch a synergism lord i pray that we'll lay hold of that and that will be our new normal lord mm -hmm. lord i pray like even uh, lord i thank you for the the tremendous expediency and uh, that, that leaders are addressing the homeless because suddenly they see that if the homeless uh, we don't uh, wipe out coronavirus or protect them, that that will invade the whole population. Mm -hmm. But my prayer specifically is that we'll have that same resolve and say, this should not be, let's solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that even as we're looking and seeing a tremendous outpouring of goodwill to help the hungry and those, Lord, that will open our eyes and see that there has been hungry before this this has ex exacerbated it and that should not be lord lord what we can accomplish together lord the whole world covered with your glory the knowledge of the glory of the lord covering the earth the way the water covers the seas and let the followers of jesus model it mm -hmm. yes lord i think if we give up our pretension that everyone sees through anyways what we'll get in return is your presence it's irresistible. Yes. You are that good. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. 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 Anything you want to say, John, or should we just leave it I'm, I don't know whether everyone's silent or if Zoom is broken. Uh, I am waiting for John to pray. <laughs> I'm not sure that John has anything left to pray. I think you prayed a good, a good, a okay. good prayer, Let's a covering look. prayer over Let's everything, look. Ted, frankly. Well, seal it then. <laughs> All right. All right, I fine. Yes, I'm... Fine. Very good. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to come to be together and to explore the mystery of who you are and the the fact that you've revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ is an amazing thing, but there's more to you than anything we can understand or imagine. We want your presence. We seek your presence. It was your presence that, that um, impelled Moses 
to follow you and cross the desert. It was your presence that changes the world. We want your presence. Whether we understand you or not, we want more of your presence. So we just offer you what we've spoken today. And we ask you to continue to seal our hearts to you, to bind us together in love, and to continue to reveal yourself to us and be with us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, thank you, brothers. Thank you very much. Pleasure thank meeting you, all. you, Stephen. Thank you, Ernie. Yes. John. Th yes. Nice to meet you, Stephen. God bless you. All right. Hey, God guys. Great to be with you guys. This is going to be posted on YouTube. This is going to be posted on Facebook. So, um, Ernie, maybe oh, you can help them share it. Yeah, so. I'll get you. Yeah, I'll get you the. Yeah, and maybe you can post the links in the chat when they're live, and I'll post you the show notes after that. Or later today. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay. God bless. Thank you, brothers. Bye. Go in peace. Have a good Bye -bye. day, guys. Bye.